Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jessica Ward King, also known as the Stigma Crusher. And here on this channel, we deal with issues of mental health and mental illness from my twin perspectives as a person with lived experience of bipolar 2 disorder, as well as a person with a PhD in experimental psychology. Sound like your jam? We would love to have you. Please go ahead and click that subscribe button as well as the notifications bell if you would like to be notified every single week when I post. Remember to like and share. And with that, let us get into it. Start stigma crushing for this week. So today, guys, we are going to deal with a thorny issue. And that is the issue of the relationship between mental illness and religion. Now, let me start by saying that I am one of the faithful. Uh, I am religious, a Christian. Um, I was brought up that way and have since made the choice to remain that way. Um, but my faith journey has been somewhat marred by my struggles with mental health and mental illness. And I just want to talk pretty briefly today about what that, that struggle has looked like for me. Um, fully recognizing that it is not the same. No one's faith struggle um, or faith journey is the same. Um, and so what I'm explaining here is how I've experienced it and how I see the world, but I'm totally open to how other people have experienced their faith and, and mental illness as they've, as they've gone through. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, do for sure comment below if there's anything you disagree with or things that you do agree with as well. Everyone would benefit from uh, your point of view and, uh, and your ideas. So let's get into this then. Um, religion's first goal back in the day when, you know, we were on a, on a savanna somewhere or in a mountain somewhere and first coming up with this religion idea. Um, it's, it's first, one of its first ideas was to explain the world. It was science before there was science. It was a codified way of making sure that the world made some sense. And so, understandably, uh, issues of mental illness, symptoms and signs of mental illness can be very distressing. They can seem very nonsensical. So from, you know, the depressed person crying uncontrollably at the sound of a song on the radio um, to a person with schizophrenia who's having a psychotic episode um, to someone with PTSD who's having a very frightening experience all of these and, and all of the rest of the mental illnesses uh, can really show up with some really challenging uh, symptoms and signs and, and have been doing uh, since, you know, since humans began, we can only assume. Um, and so religion obviously had a role to play there, especially at the beginning, to try to figure out not only, okay, well, what is it, but how does it work and how do we stop it? And so religion really stepped into that void. Um, and so thinking about it um, in terms of what is it? Well, one, you know, pretty decent for the time assumption was demonic possession. Someone that's talking to themselves or someone that's crying uncontrollably reasonably could be possessed by some demon that we don't know about, right? Um, and so that was one of the explanations. Um, of course, there's also the idea of moral or spiritual weakness so that you're not strong enough in your faith to be able to withstand some of the trials and tribulations you're undergoing. And that's why you're having these, these horrible symptoms. Um, another one is God is testing your faith. Uh, so, you know, that one shows up in scripture uh, again and again, uh, at least in my, my Christian scripture, again and again. Um, and in our narratives about it, where, you know, God's just testing you. And if you just stay the course, you will reap the, the benefits and the rewards at the end. Um, and then, of course, too, there's the whole idea that this is punishment for something you did or didn't do. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are just kind of the top four things that came to mind in terms of how does religion explain having mental illness? The next piece then, once we know how, how those, you know, these symptoms got there, is how do we get rid of them? And from that, religion has come through uh, exorcism, of course, to get rid of the, the demon that presumably is, is there, if you're assuming that there's demonic possession. Um, some kind of religious rigor, you know, doing <clears throat> a certain amount of 
steps of you know prayer and, and ablutions and so on um on a, on a continual basis um there are like sacraments sacrifices anointing um banishment from your faith community faith healings i mean all of these different ways that we have to try to attack this this mental illness construct that we have a variety of explanations for. And so therefore we must have a variety of, of solutions for it as well. Um, <clears throat> and for, so for me coming through this, I, I, I came through these things in my faith journey um, where, you know, I, I came to the conclusion that I was just, just a bad Christian, that, that I was, you know, being punished by God, that, um, you know, did, did God even love me at all? And um, I came through to the conclusion that I was the problem, right? So we, we have all these, these ideas about how it got there. But then really at the end, it's like, well, I, I need to be fixed. I need to be my, my faith journey, my, my belief system, my faith needs to be fixed. Um, and it leaves a person, um, or at least my person, it leaves me um, feeling very broken and very unworthy and uh, very much stigmatized, to be honest. So there's like that, there's this fear, this fear of mental illness, fear of people with mental illness, really, because I mean, honestly, if it's demonic possession, that's frightening, right? So I'm afraid of someone who's possessed by a demon. So <laughs> there's that kind of just baked into the explanatory model. There's also shame, uh, shame over not being good enough, over God not, you know, anointing you over... Um, you know, being a bad Christian, as I say, um, there is that guilt that you can't be better, that you can't pray harder, that you can't do better. And then there's even a hatred of mental illness and of people to a certain extent with mental illness, because again, they are potentially possessed. They are uh, potentially being punished and you don't know for what. Do you want to be associated with that person or with that family even. I mean, it can really bleed out into the community. Um, and leaving a person to be banished or to be you know, marginalized from their community. And so this journey that I had, this particular experience of faith that I had was really, really damaging. And it came kind of to a head for me over a bunch of different things I was being told uh, by my faith community. Um, by the leaders in my faith community, by, by the members of my faith community, by, I, uh, at least I believed at the time, my, my scriptures. Um, and so these are things like, let go, let God. If you just, you know, have faith and trust, you could be well. Also, just pray harder. That one was a common daily uh, admonition of just pray harder. Like, why Why aren't you being healed? People would think, why Why aren't you being healed? You're not trying hard enough. That is why you are not being healed. Um, the, the idea, of course, demonic influence was always there, but the, the really there through your faith, you are healed. That was a, a, a common, you know, it's, it comes from scripture. It's, it's said a lot. Through your faith, you will be healed. Not healed? Not a lot of faith then, is there? So it's been very challenging for me, but what finally got me to the point where I could respond to this in a way that was going to to help myself, because these narratives were not helping me. Perhaps they could help others, but these narratives were not helping me. So the thing that finally got me there, you know, from this idea that it's a failure of my faith, it's like an ethical my mental illness was an ethical issue, not a medical issue under this kind of construct, uh, was when I was told, God never gives you more than you can handle. I was told this two days before I ended up in psychiatric hospital with suicidal intent. And so as I sat in that hospital and thought back on you know, the days previous, and God never gives you more than you can handle. And I said, I call bull on that. I am calling bull on that because this right here, this, this, I'm going, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm having ideas of suicide. I want to end my life. That's more than I can handle. And God didn't give me this.
didn't happen. And so I came to the conclusion that whenever someone is telling you what God wants or thinks, they can take us elsewhere. Whenever they start telling me how I should be, they can take that elsewhere as well. Um, they start telling me my medical condition is actually an ethical or moral one. They can take that elsewhere. And then, of course, uh, fear, guilt, and shame, whenever those are being thrust my way from anyone, religion or not, they can take it elsewhere. Um, and that, so that was my moment. And I realized, you know, I was, I was struggling with, does Jesus even love me? And, and this, this, this narrative allowed me to come to the conclusion that, yes, Jesus does love me. And I have mental illness. And it's not my fault. And I shouldn't be ashamed. Now, this is my journey through this kind of narrative about religion and mental illness. As I say, there are many narratives, um, and this one just happened to be my journey. Um, but it's not as though religion is itself diametrically opposed to mental illness. Not at all. It may be that some of the older ways of thinking uh, might not be helpful in terms of now an explanatory model of mental illness, because we know more, we know better in a lot of cases. In some cases, we don't, granted. Um, but in a lot of cases, we do know we have better information, better knowledge now. Um, and so perhaps those older ways of thinking, talking about demon possession, talking about not praying hard enough, uh, not being healed because you don't have faith, um, those things maybe are not quite so realistic or so helpful at this point, at least not to myself. But there are lots of aspects of religion and of faith that are super helpful and have been super helpful to me. And so what I ended up doing was I, I was in, you know, a faith tradition that was maybe a little bit more pedantic in terms of um, um, of older ways of thinking. And I, I went and I found myself a, a faith community uh, that wasn't quite so much. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. My faith community that I'm in now still has a troubled relationship with mental illness. Um, I'm, I'm not being told all of those things that were so harmful to me before, but there's still, uh, uh, there, there's still a certain amount of unease uh, between the two bedfellows, between mental illness and religion. Um, and so when my faith community just recently uh, decided that they were going to celebrate mental health or mental illness awareness um, on a Sunday, and this was the first time they'd done so, ever. And I was like, okay, good. Step one. So, you know, nowhere is perfect, but... There have been a lot of things about religion that have helped me out as a person with mental illness. Um, so here's just a few of the things I, I thought of in terms of how has how does mental illness and religion, how do they work well together? Um, and the first thing is is prayer. Prayer can be extremely helpful um, if you're, uh, you know, the faithful um, and living with mental illness uh, because it allows you to be self-reflective. It can allow you to be very loving. Now, it depends on how you're praying and, and what words you're using and, and, and you know, what narratives you're using um, when you're praying, praying. But if you are using a reflective and self-loving way of prayer, um, it can be really helpful just to center uh, yourself and, uh, and to take some time to, for self-care, really. Um, my pastor has been very supportive. Um, they, he's good to bounce stuff off of. Um, he's, uh, not perfect, but he's excellent, uh, for, um, just, you know, helping to talk things through and not a, not a therapist, but a, a, a a good friend with some background. Let's put it that way. Um, he's got his expertise, and uh, and and it's helpful to me um, from time to time. The community I that I am living within as well. The, my community of faith is very helpful. Um, first of all, there's lived experience there. So you know, if there's more than four people in a community, then somebody has mental illness. If I'm the one, okay, add another four and you've got at least two of us kind of thing. Um, and so in a congregation of around 400, there's, 
roughly 100 people that have or have lived through mental illness. And so that being able to leverage that lived experience and find out, you know, how how does it work for you? How, what helps you um, can be really, really fantastic, even if, you know, the solutions don't always help everyone. There is also the opportunity to study scripture within religion. And so um, the Christian scriptures are, you know, a rich source of all sorts of, you know, stories and kind of morality plays and um, philosophies, all, all different kinds of things that you can, you can get out of there and use when they are worth, worthwhile for you to use. You know, some, I find that some stories are useful for me when I'm depressed and, and, and those same stories don't work well for me when I am doing well or when I'm hypomanic. And so, you know, there's a, a whole great big book in my case, maybe in your case, it could be several, um, but at least in, for me, it's a whole great big book of things to draw on for inspiration um, and for trying to make sense of my experience of the world. Um, meditation is another piece uh, that is can be really helpful in terms of um, centering oneself. It can be helpful when I'm uh, having insomnia, so to be able to, to meditate, have learned that discipline and to be able to use it to help uh, myself go to sleep. Um, but also to help, you know, when I'm ex extremely anxious or when I'm extremely sad uh, to be able to, you know, get out of myself and out, out of my, that experience and, and move into something that's more contemplative and, and more helpful to me at that time. And then finally, music. Uh, for myself, uh, I sing and I love to sing. And so, and those, you know, the, the old standards of our different faith traditions um, are, you know, things that are they're easy to sing, almost like a lullaby and that you know them by heart and don't need to think about the words necessarily or even about the music, but can you just get lost in it. Um, and that's something that I know is true for me. Um, there are more, there are more ways that my faith journey and my faith tradition help nourish me as a person with mental illness. Um, and, and as I say, it, it's not all bad news uh, for religion and mental illness. I see as we go forward um, with an increased understanding that the older ways of thinking uh, aren't helpful any longer. Um, we're not even going to talk about whether they're true or whether they're false or whether they meet, you know, any of those things. We're just going to talk about that for people with mental illness, a lot of those those narratives about mental illness are no longer helpful. They lead to stigma. They lead to a person feeling badly about themselves, uh, you know, wondering if they're loved, wondering if they're possessed, wondering if they're um, if, if they're worth, worthwhile to be living. Um, and so those kinds of narratives are, are simply not helpful. And as we move away from those narratives and towards more being able to integrate some of the more scientific ideas about mental illness, which are themselves not perfect, uh, but being able to integrate some more of those into our experience of faith um, and, and being able to, to, to really leverage the things in faith that are helpful to a person at that time. Um, and, and maybe take a little bit less of a focus on the things that are not that helpful to that person at that time. Um, not talking about picking and choosing religion, but rather picking and choosing which aspects of one's faith journey to focus on at a given point in time. And I think that as we start to do that, we start to have these these conversations uh, in amongst ourselves in religion um, that we really will be able to leverage the best of faith journeys and the best of religion to help folks with mental illness. So that's my view of it. Um, take it or leave it as you will. Um, but uh, I really do think that there is something to be said for um, the way that religion affects the faith journey and the way that the faith journey affects religion as well. So my experience of religion might have been very, very different if my mental illness hadn't existed or had been looking different to me. Um, so they're very interdependent. So that's all I wanted to say today. Um, I would look forward to hearing your guys' ideas and thoughts in the comments. Remember, uh, keep it uh, um, respectful, and uh, I will definitely answer you. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Bye. Stigma Crusher.